I have quite a bunch of slides that are only 20, 25 minutes, so I will go quite quickly and uh, I will leave any questions, if any, at the end of the presentation, or we can follow up offline if you are interested in specific topics. <coughs> so, oh, let me move to Skype, first of all. That's a good thing to do. Okay, so I'm Matteo Carlini. I'm the software technology manager within an ARM for the firmware, boot, UEFI, and recently system guidance software. So what I'm going to present today is a quick journey about the secure boot story within ARM. So talking about specifically the ARM Trusted Core Boot, its public key infrastructure, its chain of trust and how the untrusted firmware implements this specification. And then I will move to combine this fact with the UEFI secure boot, so explaining which are the differences and how to combine these two spec with open source software implementations to achieve basically a complete chain of trust. Then I will also mention very briefly some other solutions like Android based or Uboot based. Um, and I will share the next plans and future steps from an ARM perspective. So, very quick introduction, what is Secure Boot? Well, it's all about trust. It's all about creating and maintaining a chain of trust among the different software layers that are executed on a system. So, as George pointed out yesterday during the keynote, if we implement a secure boot based on industry standards, existing specs, and specifically open source software, we can achieve basically full interoperability, a faster integration and time to market, and an improved open source security, leveraging the community effort. So all the concepts that I'm going to explain, uh, especially for the ARM Trusted Core Boot, and partially for the UEFI boot, are applicable uh, on different market segments. The first obvious one is the enterprise server networking, where UEFI is the number one choice. Uh, then we can also make some thoughts about the embedded and mobile client, where trusted board boot can be married with some other concepts like verified boot or uh, U-boot, basically. But in general, I will talk about on the 8A ecosystem. Uh, this fo the, the focus of this presentation is not about M or R class devices. It's just about A. And a couple of well-known pictures from our website, just to point out which is the focus of this presentation. So the trusted firmware layer with the PBR spec, that's the software side spec, and the UEFI layer, so having a UEFI compliant firmware. I'm not going to talk about hardware, I'm not going to talk about how to create and have a tamper-proof protected root of trust. There is a separate session and, se and other ARM representatives that will talk about hardware part. So, um, what are ARM Trusted Boot, PBB for friends, and the UEFI Secure Boot. So those are two distinct specifications uh, that have, that defines different keys, different certificates, but basically they have the same goal. So verifying the authenticity of the software images, so building the chain of trust. The only point is that they target different bootloader images at different layers. So on the right, you can see a high level picture then we will go into detail about this picture. But so ARM TDB basically spans from the uh, so-called BL1, so the very first firmware executed after power on reset, up to the BL33, so the normal world bootloader. 
while the UEFI Secure Boot starts from there and it tries to validate in the open source image. So these are the boundaries basically of the two specs and implementations. So if we try to combine them together, we will then achieve a full chain of trust from the very first firmware up to the OS. So what is ARM-TBD? So ARM-TBD is based on a couple of specs, TBSA and TBDR, uh, that are part of the BSA, DBR test uh, spec suites from ARM, so the base system architecture for the hardware requirements and the board boot requirements for the software firmware requirements. They are available sick, still under NDA, but we are working on it. Um, the trusted firmware implementation is specifically based on the TBDR client spec. And again, we are working internally to revive the spec and maybe provide a server-side specification. If you are interested in, we can catch up later on. So our TBD is all about creating a chain of trust from the very first ROM firmware, BL1, up to the BL33, so the normal world firmware. A quick news. Uh, we are discussing on ARM Server AC a new change of request to the new 1.1 SBDR spec that will basically extend the concept of secure boot, mandating at least the presence of a complete cascading chain of trust. We will not mandate any specific implementation. That's not the purpose. We are discussing at least to have a complete chain of trust from the very first firmware up to the normal world bootloader. Uh, TDD and ARM plus the firmware implementation provide a reference example and reference software for achieving this goal. But as I said, other third party solution will be any way allowed from, for the SDDR. So quick details on how the TBB defines the public key infrastructure. So it starts with defining two implicitly trusted components and hardware protected root of trust uh, was public part, the public keys stored on some trusted registers and the BL1 that is supposed to be trusted because again protected by hardware. Uh, then every subsequent BL image, BL3X image uh, we come with two certificates, a key certificate and a content certificate. The key certificate basically holds the public key corresponding of, to that specific BL3X image that will be used to validate the content certificate. And the content certificate will hold instead the hash of the BL3X image that is then checked against the hash of the provided image to verify the authenticity of the image. Uh, then there are two key pairs that are defined. We will see them more in detail in the next slides. A trusted word key and a normal word key pair. All these keys and hashes are included as extensions to the standard X509 certificates. Uh, certificates are self-signed, there is no need at all for a proper CA here because basically we are building the, uh, we are establishing the chain of trust by verifying the content of the certificates and not by verifying the validity of the issuer of a specific, of a specific certificate. So there is no need for a valid CA. Uh, this is just an explanation for offline reading, I'm going to skip this one. So the big picture of the different bootloader stages, on the left we see the implicitly trusted components, in the middle the secure world images, and on the right the normal world bootloader stage, BF33. Um, from a key ownership perspective, the TPBR spec foresees basically that the root of trust public key and the trusted key certificates are owned by the OEM, while the other key certificates are there because they allow for delegating the signing authority to other parties, for example, the SOC vendor, the trusted OS vendor, or the rich operating system vendors. 
So that's why there are all these kind of different key certificates. So now let's see from a high level point of view, but which are the basic steps for providing the authentication from BL1 up to BL33. Every image has a color, and there is a legenda that explains the execution level in which this bootloader stage executes. So at power on, BL1 is executed. The first thing that it does is uh, it checks the blue, light blue certificate, that is the BL2 content certificate. Uh, and it checks the validity of the root of trust public key that is enclosed in that certificate. And then, using this root of trust public key, it basically verifies the authenticity of this content certificate. It extracts the hash of the BL2 image, and it verifies the BL2 authenticity, authenticity uh, by checking the, uh, its hash. So this is the only code that is executed at EL3 up to now. Then the execution is passed to BL2 that does not execute anymore at EL3. It executes at secure EL1. So this is done for minimizing the code that is executed at EL3 from an authentication point of view. So now BL2 executes and um, its job is to verify the authenticity of all the subsequent images. And how it does it is, again, it verifies the validity of the root of trust public key that is enclosed in that top level gray key certificate that is called by the spec trusted key certificate. So using this root of trust public key, it basically verifies the certificate and extracts the two enclosed public keys that are trusted world public key and normal world public key. As I said, these are still owned by the OEM from a spec point of view. So then for each BL3X image, BL2 first of all verifies the authenticity of the key certificate that is corresponding to that BL3X image using the trusted word public key that it has stored before. Then it reads the enclosed BL3X public key that is used to verify the authenticity of the underlying light blue content certificate. And the content certificate holds the corresponding BL3X hash of the BL3X image. So then the final step is performing the hash check uh, between BL3X provided image and BL3X into the, into the certificate. So by doing so, all the BL3X images are verified. And then, it's again BL2 responsibility running at SQL1 to verify the final BL33 normal world image. There are separate set of certificates also in this case, again for allowing uh, a separation of the, of the signing authority, in this case to an operating system vendor. So in this case we use the normal world key that is used to verify BL33 key certificate that holds the BL33 public key used to verify the content certificate and then very final step BL33 image is validated against its hash that's it from a TBD perspective the execution is then passed through the various stages, BL3.1, BL3.2, and so forth, till BL3.3. This is the big picture of the spec. Now let's have a look at the trusted firmware implementation. Trusted firmware implements everything of the TPBR spec, including the non-volatile counters that I didn't mention, uh, but 
these are used for protecting against rollback attacks. The only thing that this doesn't implement yet are the trusted debug certificates that are used basically to put the system in a debug mode. But if someone is interested in, please shout and we will push it into our roadmap. Uh, the trusted board boot works perfectly on both ARCH64 and ARCH32 on the upstream GitHub code. And we have reference example on Juno and FEV platforms of the TBDB running at ARCH32 as well. I'm not going through all the build flags. You can go have a look at the user guide on GitHub. Another bit news uh, below in bold. So in the last release, well, upstream since few months, uh, there is an integration of the trusted board boot with the ARM Trust Zone CryptoCell product, specifically the CC712 product. Uh, in order to take advantage of the hardware root of trust and the uh, hardware acceleration engines for verifying the images. So this is all about TBB. Now a quick look at UEFI Secure Boot. So UEFI uh, defines basically an ownership model for the platforms based on three main actors, the platform owner, that is usually the ODN, the OEM, or the end user, uh, the platform firmware, that is whatever UEFI compliant firmware, and the OS or third party software vendors, uh, in brief software vendors as the so uh, it defines a known set of key certificates uh, and so forth, and a signature database, so a database of white and blacklist signatures of allowed and forbidden images. So using this framework, the firmware, the UEFI firmware running at VN33 is able to authenticate all the UEFI acceptables, and there is also a way uh, through the ownership model to update the signature database from trusted sources. Uh, we will see that in the next slides. Very quickly again, so UEFI Secure Boot defines two different keys, platform key owned by the platform owner and key exchange keys. The main point of this slide is that the platform key owned by the platform owner is the real root of trust of the UEFI Secure Boot. Because using the private part of the platform key, uh, you can enroll and deploy to, to the firmware all the public keys, either the platform key and the key exchange keys. Uh, obviously, all those keys uh, based on the UEFI spec must be on tamper-proof storage, hardware protected. <coughs> And uh, as I said, the ownership model allows then the platform owner and the software vendors to update this, the database of the signatures uh, with white or black list through the UEFI runtime set variable API from trusted sources. So using the public part, the public portions of the key that have been deployed into the firmware. And then, uh, very obviously, as one could expect, these signatures are used to verify and to run or prevent the execution of specific UFI executables. So all the images that comes with a forbidden signature or with an unknown signature in light gray are not allowed to be executed while the all the images that comes with the green signatures are obviously executed. So what is the status on ARM? Well, the status on ARM is exactly the same at the moment as ARM explained one and a half year ago in, I think, Las Vegas, 2016. So the outstanding problem was, okay, how can we update the variables through the secure world? So now, one and a half year later, we can provide a mechanism for doing that. So we have, and we will sh I will show you in the next couple of slides, a way to, uh, from a spec perspective, 
implement a secure variable access and update the UEFI variables. So this is a picture that basically puts all together the pieces that we saw before. I'm not going to spend too much time. So all the different bootloader stages are verified either by the TBB spec and implementation and subsequently from the UEFI firmware spec. But here is the picture that I would like to land to. So how to access secure variable through the secure world. So as promised, I'm not going to talk about hardware. So I suppose just that the keys are stored in some sort of secure storage, hardware protected. Uh, but how can we access those keys and update them from the normal world? So the, the OS running in the normal world will call as usual the runtime set variable API that we go into the firmware and then with the implementation in the firmware of the R ML interface, we can go down into the trusted firmware running at VL31. And here is the new part. So in orange, you will see the secure partition manager. That is a functional block that basically instantiates, manages, and deletes secure partitions running in secure EL0. Please note that this is a framework that is in common with the Rust story that someone else will explain during this connect. So this is the very same exact framework. Rust is one use case. Secure variable access is another use case using the same functional pieces altogether. So the secure partition manager in BL31 will route this request and will instantiate a secure partition that then will handle and will have a driver to access the variable storage somewhere on hardware tamper proof. So uh, the various pieces are currently in development within ARM and they will be upstream very soon and we will also work internally to provide a reference example of all the boot flow, the secure boot flow, including secure variable access on one of our system guidance platform and we are going to upstream also the support for this specific <coughs> system guidance platform with all the surrounding patches to EDK2, EDK2 platform, unfrosted firmware and so forth for implementing all this story here. Very, very quickly, just to mention other possible solution to implement verified boot, well, on the mobile client side, uh, UEFI is kind of mm, a nonsense to some extent. So Android has its own concept of verified boot, U-boot has its own concept. All of them have concepts of uh, chain of trust, hardware root of trust, and so on. Uh, a provocation, the last bullet point. So what if we think of extending the work that has been done by the SUSE guys, so putting UEFI on top of your boot, what if we extend it trying to implement the set variable and get variable APIs on your boot? And maybe what if we try to plug shim over a UEFI enabled your boot for handling the key management? So this will introduce a lot of problems that we will have to address. Uh, especially on the embedded devices. But the end goal could be, ideally, to have a convergence of the embedded and enterprise secure boot flows and secure boot APIs. And these are some faults that we are doing internally. Last slide, which are the plans? So as I said, we are working internally to implement and then open source a reference platform software uh, well, apart of the different pieces in our firmware and EDK2, also to provide the complete boot path on the system guidance platform. Uh, actually, it should be Brooks, that the uh, enterprise server platform. In the future, we are thinking of, uh, okay, as I said, investigating a U-boot based solution, but also how to combine the firmware update story. So ARM trusted firmware has its own firmware upgrade. UEFI has recently defined the signed capsule update for secure update. 
So how to combine the two and have also a proper secure firmware update mechanism. So these are all thoughts for the future. On a specification perspective, uh, I'm not a specification guy. There are different R representatives here talking about spec, but we are talking about reviving the TBBR and putting some mentions in the SBBR. And as I said, the possibility for having a server side TBSA TBBR that will take care of also other concepts like the TPM, PCRs, and measure boot that are currently not covered by ARM specs in general. And there is one outstanding question on the table. So what is the proper level of standardization required by ARM on the pre-UEFI environment for the trusted board boot solution? So we want still to allow for differentiation on that level, but we also see a lot of security reports that uh, sadly demonstrate how some <coughs> flows implementation on commercial products allows for running arbitrary code at year three, so compromising the entire trusted execution environment. So, and that's probably something we would like to avoid, at least providing some guidance on the uh, APIs that could be implemented <coughs> and where to implement those APIs, in which, at which execution levels. But these are all open thoughts, so if you are interested in, get in touch. And that's it. So I'm just deferring to that specific session for hardware root of trust. That should be on Thursday, I think. Uh, that's it. That's all that I have. Any question? Yeah, right now you're Right now, your um, your uh, uh, checks for validating uh, images only has one uh, kind of hash. It doesn't have to allow for. I don't think it allows for SHA 512 or HMAC. And I was wondering if you guys were thinking of adding like an HMAC, having more types of uh, validations that you support. Okay, um, I don't have the answer for it. So we can follow up later on. Maybe Dan can can also can grab the microphone to Dan. That's the tech lead for Antrust Firmware. Thank you. Hi, yeah, the Antrust Firmware reference implementation is, is just kind of following what the TBBR spec says. So if the TBBR spec was updated to include a stronger crypto, then we certainly follow. But there's no reason why we could add that or someone yeah. could contribute that. But anyway, but we, we're not motivated to do that because it's not in spec. Really, uh, something uh, really quick. Um, I noticed you guys use a lot of the X509 extensions. Why not use, well, in some of the cases, it seems like the same five, regular 509 regular fields would suffice. Why add all these extensions in existing fields? Uh, that's again comes to the, 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 spe the specification, just, just talk about that. Um, I, I guess that the specification had a lot of design information as well as specification information, so uh, it put a bit more freedom perhaps to do, do things in a different way there, but it works. <laughs> well, that, that's anyway a good moment for discussing any updates on that spec if you want, because uh, as I said, so we are thinking of reviving and updating that spec that's becoming quite old and also providing a server-side equivalent. So if you have any specific need to target, we, we can discuss it and try to push it into the spec afterwards. The, the latest is 2013. Is there a newer spec than that? Sorry? The latest spec I see is from 2013. No, it should be 2015 or That's 2016. client spec is 2015. Yeah. The server spec hasn't been updated since then. Oh no, but the server spec basically it, 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 it was it was just an experiment. It has never been finalized okay. properly. So it would be basically to rewrite it from, from scratch from the beginning. And we are working with the architecture guys to start the discussion around it. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> 
I know your slide on secure partition variable access. Um, you didn't have any thing like walk off T or a secure OS in that picture. Is, is there plans to actually be able to do it without having all that other infrastructure? Good question. Thank you. So uh, currently, this model uh, does not allow for a combination of different application, secure application to be run in the secure world. But, so you cannot have in parallel running a trusted OS together with a secure partition at the moment. Uh, but we are working for extending this model, allowing for multiple secure partition to be run. And depending on the use case, you can have as well as, as, well as OPT running in parallel with a secure partition, and then you will have to decide who is doing what. So who is accessing the secure variable and who is not. But so those are in our plans. Uh, yeah. So for the early 2018. So why not allow the simpler model of just loading up T at boot and, and, and making the secure ver variables a, a secure service? That's a good question. So um, UEFI plus OPD on a server enterprise platform? Why? Wait. I, I still wonder why we have to differentiate between client and server as much as we Let's put it this way. We had this infrastructure almost really from the, well, for implementing the RAS program and the RAS use case. So uh, you can end up having two secure partitions, one that is handling the error, uh, firmware, firmware first error handling for the RAS story, and another one in parallel that is implementing secure variable story. So uh, there are, I know that there are other plan, other parallel developments in ARM that basically try to do the same with OPT. Uh, we have still to marry the two developments and decide what would be the best choice, depending on the market again. So if you're putting this stuff on a server rather than on a mobile client, maybe the solution would be different. You're over time. <laughs> right? Thank you. Thank you, Joel.